Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Wednesday, September the 18th. Uh, I want to thank our excellent uh, volunteer crew and wonderful Shaw staff who make all of this able to be happen. Uh, the first part of Citizens Forum is always the Walter and Jack show, so we'll start off. Uh, I'm going to start off talking about the Rifflandia concert. I live about a block and a half away from there. To me, it was an assault on our city okay. and the people of our city. Now, the Rifflandia concert it was for people that don't know. It was a uh, what was it like a three-day event? Yeah, it was. Uh, I think Thursday night. I'm not sure, but Friday night, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday, finishing at nine o'clock on Sunday. So luckily, yeah. I wasn't home much over the weekend, so I didn't have to really put up with it. But at eight thirty on Sunday night, it was in my bedroom. It was as if somebody had come into my bedroom and turned on their radio and told me, if you don't like it, screw you, because that seems to be the message. They came into my bedroom, turned up the radio pretty darn loud, and told me that I have to get out. That is, as far as I can see, what happened with this concert. Now, I'm sure there's a way to make this concert happen that is of much, 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 much less problem to everybody. But there's no talking about it, you know? It's, it's being supported, as far as I can see, by all the media in the city. Uh, for example, here's, here's, the, here's some letters to the editor that the Times columnist chose to print today, Wednesday the, the 18th. In Saanich, I heard on the radio, they had so many calls of complaint over the weekend that they had to bring on another staff person to answer the phone. Now, I heard on the radio that no, that didn't happen, but that'll give you an idea of how many phone calls were coming in complaining. This is in Saanich, yeah. never, mind, never mind Victoria. So here's two letters that the TC printed. The first one says, Residents in the area, you know, this is part of it. Residents in the area can handle a bit of muffled bass for a couple of days, or bass for a couple of days, in return for a peaceful event showcasing creativity and art. Nobody has any problem with peaceful creativity and art. And for those who just can't bear it, the event is planned well ahead of time. Take a vacation or go out for the day, or in this case, for three days and enjoy our beautiful province. So it's like the message from the media is, if you don't like this, just leave your home, right? Because we're going to do it. And you know, it's like the smart meter thing, which we're going to talk about. It's exactly the same issue. Because if they can do this to some people, they can do it to everybody. Our wonderful Victoria City Council and city bureaucracy, in spite of the thousands, I would assume, of complaints, certainly thousands of irritated people, hundreds of complaints, the city has already said they're going to do it again. Our city councillors are, are in the media saying, you know, it wasn't bad, put up with it. I'll just read the, the second uh, letter to the editor. Loved the loud music of Rifflandia enlivening my staid South Oak Bay neighborhood over the weekend. I could even hear it indoors from my armchair, but she liked it. So here she is three miles away, two and a half miles away in Oak Bay. <laughs> and she is, you know, and, and they're telling us, get used to it. Well, they're coming for everybody. Uh, the Victoria News, right through the whole city. I mean, why is the media the Victoria News Group, Santa Cruz, Victoria News, all of them, I think, carried this, this um, editorial. <clears throat> you know, a lot of complaints. But one has to look at the other side of the equation before passing judgment. Not only does the festival provide economic benefits to the city, the efforts organizers make to create an environment that is respectful, respectful, respectful. They're saying they go, the organizers make it respectful flexible and family friendly family friendly i know somebody went to the concert she said they were she she loved it but she was wearing earplugs right that's yeah city staffers confirmed this week that the festival operated w within the limits from a decibel perspective i don't i stopped believing in city staffers a long time ago who knows if that's true or not 
And it goes on and on and on. So the Times columnist, Saanich News, CFAX, CFAX had somebody on from Saanich Police talking about how the Saanich Police protect noise in Saanich 24 hours a day. The Saanich Police, as far as I can tell, are there not to protect you from noisy things, but to protect the noisemakers from you. For example, there's a mall that they just built a couple of years ago, Shelburne and Mackenzie. All the noise from that mall they put next to a condo complex. Yeah. Those people have paid a heavy price. The inside of the mall, it's, uh, it's Shelburne and Mackenzie, the new mall there. Yeah. The, within the mall, it's very pleasant. But this is, you know, they're, they're coming. They're coming. The industry, <laughs> the corporation, this is just one more step. Well, the noise is an issue for sure, uh, you know, and I would feel like, hey, who doesn't like a, a good event, a good music event? But really, technically, you don't have to have it that loud if you put lots of speakers out around the grounds, point them inward to the people who actually want to hear the music and not blast them from one side and blast it out into the world. You know, there's, there's ways to probably make that about half as noisy with hardly any with hardly any effort whatsoever just with a little bit of a will and a little bit of creativity really it's unbelievable so you know, topic number two smart meters well topic number two um we're going to talk about smart meters guess would you believe that but uh we got our letter this week from bc hydro telling us that since we still have our old analog meter we have to make a decision what we're going to be doing and they gave us our three options and a lot of people got these letters uh, but the what, what's really the kind of the joke of it is that in the three options they give you no matter how you spin it around eventually you're going to get a smart meter so even yeah. though it looked like you know they were kind of offering some kind of a deal to the refuse nicks and and 30 that's no deal i think if you want to keep it isn't it 35 dollars a month that's right if you want to keep your old meter the old analog this, meter this is <laughs> this is our government yeah yeah i mean this is a crown corporation it's unbelievable well it's you know some people call it extortion when, when you, it is when, when, you, when you have to pay somebody not to give you a product that you don't not want. to do something to you not to expose yourself to that type of radiation you have to pay someone to keep well, them I know away. somebody who has a business and next uh, you know in, in the wall next to the business are three three or four meters for the business and for some uh, apartments in the, in the building well there's three or four meters right together yeah. Is this person going to be paying like $140 a month to get those meters because, you know, they think it's not safe? Uh, this, is, this is beyond the pale. It's unbelievable. Where, where, is, where are these powers coming from to do these things to well, us? Well, you know, where does it all come from? Of course, we live in a world of public relations. Public relations firms set the agenda in, in political parties. They set the policies. They set... The, the platform, how the message is delivered. They tell governments what to do. We are being ruled by public relations firms who are the mouthpieces of large corporate interests. So it's just basically a way to co a conduit to get the corporate interests funneled into the government. But if you, if you look at their math, for instance, Hydro's math, and they're really challenged in math, is uh, that, say for instance, I'll be keeping my analog meter and I'm going to be paying $35 a month. Well, they want $35 a month for me, for, for, that, uh, for me to keep the meter. Uh, but if you do some quick math, you do like 60,000 people, $35 a month, that's something like $23 million a year Hydro is getting Holy to read smokes. these meters. So I did a little bit more just rough off at back of the envelope calculating. I said, well, if you hire a meter reader, 25 bucks an hour, eight hours a day, and he, he or she manages to read, say, 100 meters a day. Well, uh, they just collected $3,500 worth of fees to read the meters. They wow. paid the meter reader 200 bucks. Hydro's making 3,300 off of it. Oh, and by the way, you know, uh, if you actually try to figure this out, it's very hard to, but uh, we're calculating it could be 100 to 150,000 holdouts, not 60,000. So if you do that math, 
you realize maybe they're getting around $60 million a year to uh, totally outright getting, uh, uh, they're not doing anything for this. Yeah. And they're actually going to profit from the people who are not going to want the meters. So they're, they're, they're going to the laughing all the way to the bank with this deal. It's un I mean, this is, this is what it's come to. Where's the NDP on the issue? As far as I can tell, completely silent. The Liberals are the ones who are doing it. But of course, they're doing it for corporate Canada. That's who's behind this. It's, it's happening around the world, everywhere. Just remember, Jack, I mean, the technology that we're talking about with these smart meters, of course, and the, 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 the so-called uh, controversy about the health effects can be set aside. But what's undeniable is a few hard facts that somebody sitting anywhere in the world basically can click uh, on a keyboard and turn your power on and off. They can turn your, your major appliances on and off. If you don't pay your bill, they can just click you out, turn your power off. And also, if you're not consuming electricity in the way they like it, well, now let's project out into the future when they've cr really created some major shortages. Think of the behavior modification capabilities that the utility company is going to have on what they could do with you living in your little... That's your, right. That's you're living right. in a little, a little rat cage. So you're the experiment. We're moving into a world like, <laughs> like in the Middle Ages where you know, people are going to be more and more impoverished. I mean, they've done it to other people around yeah. the world. Why do we think we're going to be the lucky ones? And, you know, if you, if you can't pay for your uh, electricity at lunchtime or dinner time, then too bad. You just don't eat. That's, that's I guess, what it's coming to. Well, the technology is With the so full support much more of our media, who, now we don't know this is true, but the media never mentions it. The media never mentions any of these things because they don't want people thinking about them. Is, yeah. our, is what we're saying right? At least it should be part of the debate. Exactly. No, we're, we're in tough with the, with the smart meters. The issue's not going to go away. And, you know, it's unfolding right now, the level of really, it's an oppressive regime. And, uh, you know, we're going to be fighting this for a lot of years. Uh, Adrian Dix, uh, as of today, uh, we just heard a little bit on the news, um, has decided to step down. Um, and... I'm not sure when he'll be stepping down, but sometime in the next year or two, or maybe, maybe tomorrow. Um, as far as I can see, the NDP needs a complete, all political, the, the NDP needs to be democratized. I would say that, and so does the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party and, and the Green Party. We can make, we, the people who live here, can make a better set of rules that work for us. Right now, the rules of our political parties work for people who want power because once you grab that power you have total and complete control so adrian dix and the people around him as the leaders have total control basically of the entire party the membership including myself well look at who got a hold of the ndp right now there's adrian dix and a few others and the you know some of their behind him some you know the the wizards and the gurus in the NDP that seem to know so much about everything and they're they're just they don't look any different than liberals and for the most part the people that are really running the show and by the way it's public relations firms running the NDP you can't get away from these guys they don't come up with any creative ideas what I was thinking about was well you know Dix was I was wondering if Dix was going to retire or, or, or resign but the thing is, is, is that the party's still stuck in the ideology, and they're not a real opposition. Uh, they haven't. There's no real policy differences between them that you can really, you really, really point to. And I think uh, you know the CBC was uh, interviewing people, speculating why uh, Dix uh, wasn't successful, why the NDP weren't successful. Well, it was precisely because Adrian Dix wouldn't criticize the Liberal Party, particularly around the BC Hydro, uh, around the, um, you know, the, 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 all the, the issues around run of the river projects. The rate hike. The rate hikes. And the debt. 
the debt. And the deficit. The, you know, it, all these juicy issues that any because. party, of course, smart meters, they wouldn't touch that issue with a 10 foot yeah. pole. And all the issues because around the. They're, all, they're both the same on all those issues. Oh, I almost forgot the sale of BC Rail and the scandalous behavior of not only Campbell and Clark, but also of the Crown Prosecutor, the Attorney General, everyone appears to have been in collusion there to cover up what was a very, very, uh, was a criminal be criminal act. And, uh, but Adrian Dix wouldn't talk about that. So guess what? No, there was nothing to sink your teeth into here. Half the people in British Columbia stayed away from the polls. You know, nobody's talking about that in the way they should be really addressing it, is that half the people in British Columbia are disenfranchised. As far as no, I'm concerned, 100% of the people in BC are disenfranchised. Yeah, well, 50% they, still vote. Yeah, they no longer can hold their noses yeah. and vote. And that's a huge problem in, in British Columbia right now. Yeah, our governments just don't work for us. And if we can't pull that one together, then, oh, I mean, we're, we're just going down. <laughs> um, t take house prices, which is the next thing I wanted to talk about. You know, once again, the second biggest country in the world with a population of 35 million people and young people and families have to go into massive debt in order to purchase a home. And they fully intend to raise interest rates, you know, pretty soon. And when they do, it's going to be an absolute disaster. To me, this is a complete failure, once again, of, of the democratic process because the government can control housing. It's a complete failure of the private sector because clearly they haven't, well, they've done very, very well. I mean, house, land prices are at record highs in all of our cities. House prices are at record highs. You can bet that somebody has made and is continuing to make huge amounts of money. But in terms of providing for the people of Canada what we need, which is, which is decent, comfortable, good, low-cost housing in nice, pleasant communities and neighborhoods, they've completely and totally failed. Well, housing is, you know. And it's never mentioned. It's no. never mentioned. I mean, you have to look at housing as, as a, in a special category uh, of things that happen in society. And, and it, you know, if we have a fundamental right to have safe, affordable housing. It should, housing should be there for everyone, no matter what their income level is. And, and, you know, if we had that built into the equation, uh, you know, you, we wouldn't be having a lot of the problems that we're experiencing with crime and all that. On the other side, when you look at uh, some of the houses that we see around town, and uh, you find that uh, you'll take a house that's worth maybe at one and a half, two million dollars, maybe down Oak Bay or someplace. You walk through, you take a look at it, not a bad place. But that same house setting over in Langford is worth about maybe half that. So it's the speculation in the value of property. It's not the real value of, of, you know, the value of a house is that you can close the door and it'll keep you warm and keep the rain off your head. And uh, it's all this other speculation that drives the market away out of, way out of whack. Yeah, so, you know, many shows ago, somebody was on and they were talking about our housing policy is this and our housing policy is that, I've come to the conclusion that our housing policy is to massively overcharge people, put us in debt, and create a, a, a lot of poor quality housing that's being built, and to create a large segment of homeless people. Yeah. Because that's what they've done. I mean, I can only assume that this hasn't happened by mistake. It's all well thought out by the corporations and the one-tenth of one percent who run this country. Yeah, and well, homelessness, uh, under, underemployment or unemployment, uh, mental illness, uh, a lot of other Ill physical illnesses, crime in several different categories. Uh, they're all, it's an industry. You know, there's millions and millions of dollars being spent in taxpayers' money and to have police and ambulances and, you know, it's almost like it's good for business to have some pain and suffering. 
And, you know, you take that all out of there and, well, some of these guys are not going to have a job. Yeah, so I, I guess the end result is, I think we can do better than what we're doing, and we'd better start soon. We have to start soon because things are not looking that great at the moment. Um, transportation, you know, I mean, I would love to see them put a lot of money into public transportation, public, get people out of cars. Um, you know, get people more walking, get people more into bikes, get people into safe, comfortable, safe, comfortable, fast, efficient, good right. trains running through town. I mean, yeah. it's, it's all there. It's all there. And, you know, we could have quieter streets, quieter communities. You um, know, you could just have bus passes that you could use as some kind of deduction on your, on your income tax return or, you know, there's lots of incentives. Yeah. To healthier food, cheaper food. Yeah, you know, healthier and cheaper food. So, so many, so many things. <coughs> um, I just want to mention one stat that I said something about last uh, last week. Beast, my bank, the Royal Bank, made a profit of three billion dollars over the last three months, and talking about university students and the massive amount of debt that's there. You could pay thirty thousand dollars of debt off for one hundred thousand students with one bank's profit for three months. Thirty thousand of debt for a hundred thousand students for one bank's profit for three months. Where's the wealth of this country going? Walter, thank you very much. Always a pleasure, Jack. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Policy. <laughs>